It's the Happy Families Podcast. It's the podcast for the time poor parent who just wants answers now. There's one path. Go to school, get good grades, get into university, get a successful high paying job, have a big mortgage, live in a fancy suburb, drive a nice car. And and we've got to reject that. It's unhealthy at every level for 90% of the population. And now here's the stars of our show, my mum and dad. I want to say something this is very important right before this. No, it's not actually that important. I'm making it sound like it's a major announcement. It's not. But if you listen to yesterday's interview with Paul Dillon about kids going to school, he's especially in Bali and heard the conversation that I had with him about how we have a daughter who's thinking about going to Bali because she's only got one exam to go and she can't wait for school to be over so she can celebrate two things. First of all, you, you kind of made it sound like she was <laughs> she heading was over there to, to... party. No, I reckon Paul made it sound like she was <laughs> heading over there to party. party. I did nearly die when I heard the interview. <laughs> the reality is she was going over with a friend. Yes, a and their of, family. A handful of friends, but the family was mm, going as well. It was a well, family so, holiday for schoolies. Yeah. <laughs> so, but, but Bali's off the agenda anyway. That that didn't work out. And um, we, we've discovered in the last 24 hours that she's going to stay local and do something really small and really away from all of the drama and all the hype. And I'm breathing so much easier. She's well, a great kid. I'm glad you're breathing so much easier because I'm still not. It's still a big deal to let your 18-year-old just walk out the door and disappear for a week. Yeah. We've done it a couple of times already though. And, and she's a great kid and her her intentions and her friends are both excellent. So uh, if you have a, an older child, maybe one finishing year 12, who's thinking about school, is you've got to listen to yesterday's interview with Paul Dillon. Anyway, Kylie, today we're answering the question that we were supposed to answer yesterday, but uh, for a range of reasons, we had to talk to Paul yesterday. So let me read this question to you from one of our Happy Families listeners who, oh, you know what? I need to say this. I, I just checked our stats yesterday with our podcast people. We're closing in on- We have people. We have, we have podcast people, <laughs> people who look after things. Well, two things, two things. First of all, we've been nominated and been pushed through as a finalist for Best Parenting Podcast in Australia with the upcoming Australian Podcast Awards, which are just a couple of weeks away now. So we're in the mix with five other top Aussie podcasts. Who are they? Uh, oh, our competition. Uh, we've got uh, Osha. Our mate Osher and his dad pod podcast, Star Power right there. Yeah. Uh, we're up against Osher. Uh, our friend Maggie Dent and her ABC Parental as Anything podcast is another one of our competitors. Uh, there is a podcast that's out there called My Bilingual Family, which is a podcast that I, I haven't listened to. I don't know what it's like, but it's about parents are speaking one language and kids are speaking another. Sometimes I think that could be any family, but yeah. <laughs> we're talking specifically about families where um, – People have got English as a second language in as, as the adults, the parents and the family, but the kids are growing up here in Australia with English as their main language. There's a, a podcast called No Need for Prince Charming. I have no idea what that one's about. And the Tired Mummy podcast, I think the title says everything when it comes to the parenting podcast, the Tired Mummy podcast. So they're our, they're our competitors. I wish them all very well. I, I think the fact that we've got that many great parenting podcasts around who have made it to the finals, not to mention all the ones that didn't, pretty cool stuff. So the Australian Podcast Awards coming up soon, where a finalist hopefully will be a winner one day, maybe. I think it's just pretty cool that we're standing the same line as Osha, to be honest. <laughs> right, okay. Well, <laughs> whether, we get, whether we make the uh, What the are you saying? Guys. You just want to be in Osha's line? Is that what you're no, saying? No, I'm just, that's that chiseled. That's, that's that chiseled that's Jaw, that fabulous hair. His hair is just always perfect. That gravelly voice. For this stay at home mum, I think it's pretty cool. Okay. Kylie, let's talk about today's podcast. Oh, no, but what I was going to say is three million. We're, we're, on, we're closing in on three million downloads for the year. That's crazy because only a couple of months ago, you told me that we'd hit the two million. Yeah. Yeah. It's absolutely skyrocketing. So to, to everyone who's listening, thank you for making us uh, as popular as we are, I guess, uh, in that there's that many downloads, but also that we're a finalist. Uh, we, we just so appreciate that you listen and get something out of the podcast and that it makes your family happier. It's, it's great. I, I want to talk about our question for today because it's a really, I think, really important question that's come through from somebody who's dealing with a child with a whole lot of needs. But even if your kids don't have needs, my sense is you'll really relate to aspects of this question. So this comes from Mandy who asks, I've been listening to your podcast for a while now. I tend to binge listen when I get time on my own in the car. My daughter has many challenges with ADHD and autism. And now to add to the collection of labels, dyslexia. She's only eight years old and really a happy child. I've had to challenge my own thinking lately of what a happy, fulfilled life is. 
I've always thought as long as she can read and write, she'll be fine. But I'm now stuck as this may not happen for her. She may not read and write efficiently. And what does that mean for her? This latest diagnosis is new and one I'm finding difficult to accept, maybe because I'm yet to educate myself about it. My question is, when a child has so many challenges, how do I explain these to her? We've spoken about her ADHD because she's medicated and for her to understand and take the meds, I needed to explain how they help her, what's in it for her. I'm yet to talk about autism or the dyslexia with her. My worst fear is that she thinks she's stupid. How do you talk about a diagnosis with a child? When do you know that they're ready to understand? Some really important questions there, Kylie, and I'm excited to spend the rest of this podcast answering Mandy's questions. When we arrived back in Brisbane nearly six years ago, I made friends with a lady and she loves reading. And so we got talking about all the different kinds of books that she was reading and I shared some of the ones I was reading. And it wasn't actually until our friendship grew that I came to understand, that I came to know that she actually has dyslexia. I would never have known that based on the conversations we were having and the kinds of books that she'd been reading. As our friendship continued to grow, I learned that her son had dyslexia. She pulled him out of mainstream school and was able to spend a couple of years with him at home. He was extremely behind. Um, And just recently, after COVID, he was able to go back into mainstream and is doing exceptionally well. And as I listened to Mandy's questions and They're so heartfelt, Mm. this deep desire for her child to live a fulfilling life. What I see is so often it's our own fears that stop us from seeing outside the box and seeing that there actually is potential for that just in a completely different way. We have this, you know, kind of this, this mindset that there's one road to success, there's one way to do things, but there are there are plenty of people that have got any one of those labels or all of them and are able to live fulfilling lives. So today, hopefully, we can give Mandy some hope. Yeah, yeah, for sure. So I guess Mandy's main question is how do I how do I explain this to my child? Mm. Mandy's done a great job already of talking to her daughter about the a- need for medication yeah. because of the ADHD. I'm always in two minds when it comes to talking to children about their additional needs because what they don't know doesn't hurt them quite often. That is, when they've got the label, it's easy to live into that. It's easy to make it part of the identity that they uh, integrate into themselves. Oh, I can't do this because I have dyslexia and I'm autistic and I'm therefore less than. And that's that's the last thing that we want for our kids because they're not less than, but unfortunately, it, it can it can feel like that for them. Nevertheless, we also know that sometimes – being aware of, of what those additional needs are, being aware of that diagnosis helps children to understand their world differently, better, and and also understand why they are dealing with what's happening in class, for example, or what's happening in a certain context in a different way to those around them. My inclination is to sit down and, and identify that this is a challenge. We've noticed that reading is hard. When we were talking to the doctor, the doctor said that you have something called dyslexia and this is what it is. So no gimmicks, no shortcuts, just straight up, here's what it is. And then ask your child how that makes them feel. I mean, we've got a, we've got a pretty happy eight-year-old here. So hopefully the, this little girl is going to say, uh, I'm, I'm a bit sad, but okay. And then as a parent, your job is to build hope. So this is the bit where we say, so we know lots of people who have dyslexia. They can all read. They all function well. They've all got happy lives. They're all making a contribution. And this doesn't have to hold you back. This doesn't have to change anything. It just means that we have to work a little bit harder. This means that you have to be a bit stronger than the other kids. They don't have to do all the hard things that you do. And, and the focus there is if we put in the effort, if we do the work, if we do the, the, the extra tutoring or if we spend the extra time with you, you're going to be able to do this. You'll be able to turn into an adult who loves to read, who's able to contribute, who's able to to do all these things. So that would be the the central focus of where I'd be going. I'm less uh, encouraging of sharing the autism diagnosis too early. I think that she's got enough on her plate with ADHD and dyslexia. And if we can spend the time in the relationship, spend the time developing those other um, skills and attributes, I think that in time, what's going to happen is Mandy's little girl is going to 
work things out reasonably well, feel reasonably competent. And, and that's what we're really looking for here, competence. When a child feels capable, the labels don't matter. When a child feels like they're able to do things, like they have the capacity to do things, it's that basic psychological need of competence and mastery. When the child feels those things, then the labels become irrelevant. I might have ADHD, but I can still do this, 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 and this. I might be dyslexic, but I can still read as well as anyone in my grade because competence begets confidence. So that's where I'd be focusing in terms of having the conversation, a gentle conversation with the emphasis on we can do this. We can work hard and we can find solutions to make you stronger. So one of the things I loved about my friend and her situation was she didn't actually know she had dyslexia as a young kid. She just couldn't, she couldn't work out why she couldn't understand the words on the page. But her mum just read to her all the time, just completely immersed her in words and books until the point that she became so motivated. Yeah to read them herself, that she would stay up late under the covers with a torch to try and decipher what her mum had read and what the words said on the page. Kylie, the human brain is incredible. We talk about plasticity. There's that book from uh, maybe 10 or 15 years ago now by Norman Doidge called The Brain That Changes Itself, all about plasticity. The brain is incredible. When I hear you tell a story like that about a dyslexic girl with a torch under the covers reading the amount of effort, the amount of work, the, the, the challenge of that must be I- incredible, must be incredible for her. And yet she finds it so fulfilling, so rewarding that she's willing to move that mountain. I, I just think it's amazing. And we have, we, we have a daughter who has some additional needs. She doesn't have dyslexia, but it ties in with the next thing that is really important for Mandy in terms of reading, for example. I really want my children to read Great books, excellent literature, books that will change their lives, change their thinking, shape their world. I want them to read the, the very best stuff that's out there. At eight. I don't care what age they are. I just want them reading great <laughs> literature. And our daughter wants to read Pokemon and Wings of Fire. And there's part of me who uh, – part of me sort of chafes and – great against this and things come on we've got all these books on our shelves that are so good and you want to read that and then I give myself a quick uppercut and get out of the way and say but she is reading and we're talking about an eight-year-old with additional needs who's reading what 300 page books with small print we had to do a trip to Brisbane the other day. It's an hour and a half's drive. And she asked me specifically to go to the bookstore to get her a book because she didn't want to sit in the car and look out the window for an hour and a half. Yeah, and, and, and we're not going to let her sit on a screen. Reads. And so, Mandy, I guess what I'm really highlighting here, I and mean, we've got another friend who's got a, a child with massive delays in terms of autism and speech and uh, language and all that kind of thing. And he's now in his early 20s and he writes comics. He writes graphic novels. Mm. And I, I guess that, that kind of highlights – this is really about expectation setting. What what does the what does the community, the school, the the broader society say is expected? There's one path: go to school, get good grades, get into university, get a successful, high paying job, have a big mortgage, live in a fancy suburb, drive a nice car, and and we've got to reject that. It's just it's unhealthy at every level for ninety percent of the population. It's is it realistic? Is it achievable? Absolutely for a large percentage of people, but is it healthy and in everybody's best interest? No. You, if you've got a healthy developing child, you don't want them to get into first or second or third year uni or finish uni and say, okay, I've got a medical degree or I'm a lawyer, but I actually hate it. Because when I was in school, I really, really just wanted to I don't know. Um, read Pokemon. You read Pokemon or, or play, uh, build boats. Like I, I, I love the ocean or I want to I want to paint. I was going to say I want to I want to art. That's not a word. I, I, want, I want to paint. And, and I want that's, to be creative. Yeah, or dance. And, and here we are saying, well, you know what? Uh, the creative arts, you're never going to make any money in that. You need to go and get your special degree. I, it's just so, – so changing – Stepping back from that expectation that society has, that's the first thing. The second one is the expectation that you have. And I feel like you've, Mandy has done a really nice job here of saying, I just wanted to be able to read and write efficiently. That's, that's great. But now maybe we're going to say, I want her to find joy in her life. I want her to find things that light her up. And, and what is her expectation? What's your daughter's expectation for herself? I think that's so important. Yeah, well, the thing that stands out to me when I listen to Mandy's story is just the fact that she's got this really happy eight-year-old. 
she's happy and she's living in her own little world of fulfillment and joy. And now we've got these labels and we've got to try and navigate them. But I look at I look at our eight-year-old and the challenges that we've had with her. And for the most part, she doesn't know that she's any different to anyone else. Yes, that's right. She's oblivious to it. And there may come a time where we'll have to have conversations with her about that. But for the most part, she is completely oblivious to the fact that she has extra challenges and that it's harder for her to do things. Such a great point. I'm, I'm so grateful that you brought that up. I, I think what we probably need to focus on in the last maybe minute and a half, two minutes of the podcast is just what we can do, what Mandy can do and what any parent can do when their child is not looking like they are going to follow a traditional path because they have additional needs or they have interests that lay outside of the standard, um, the, the standardised path that has been established for the majority of kids. So the first thing that I want to emphasize is we want to consider educational options. Not everyone has the flexibility to homeschool or to provide an alternative form of education, even if it's just extra tutoring. But to the extent that you've got that capacity, I would say a child who has all these additional needs would definitely benefit from some kind of additional or alternative educational option. If that's not possible, and I recognise for many people it just isn't practical at all. What you said earlier, Kylie, reading and reading and reading. Time, and when you're not reading, time in the relationship. The more you can be kicking the footy down at the park or throwing the ball through the hoop or riding bikes or walking along the beach or the wherever it is that you go for recreation time, that kind of thing is going to make a huge difference. You know, finding fun ways to actually extend and support their learning so it doesn't actually feel like they're learning is is going to be so beneficial without them even recognizing that they've got a deficit yeah and that's the beauty of the the whole reading thing Mm. you're just reading because you love to read together Uh, the second thing that i would talk about or suggest is that you actually have conversations together and, and ask well is this actually a problem you, you might have ADHD, but is that actually a problem? You might have dyslexia, but is that a problem? You could do a Google and find a whole lot of people who have been enormous successes mm-hmm. who have ADHD. In fact, just while I've been saying that, uh, I was typing at the same time, and I've typed in successful people with dyslexia. Let me read the list of successful people with dyslexia. Richard Branson, Tom Cruise, Orlando Bloom, Jennifer Aniston, Leonardo da Vinci, Salma Hayek, Whoopi Goldberg, Steven Spielberg, Sure, Henry Winkler, that was Fonzie, Walt Disney, Steve Jobs, Keanu Reeves, Jay Leno, Jamie Oliver, Thomas Edison, Albert Einstein. Albert Einstein, for goodness sakes, has come up as somebody with dyslexia. Now, I don't know how right Google is, but that's what's come up. Kieran Knightley, John Lennon, Muhammad Ali, Winston Churchill, Daniel Radcliffe, Noel Gallagher. Um, I mean, the, the list is enormous. Michael Phelps, it just keeps going and going and going. When, when you talk to your kids and say, yes, you have these additional needs, but is it a problem? Was it a problem for these people? It probably was. But what they did is they worked really hard and they probably had some amazing resources, but they've done amazing things. So inspire them with the stories of those people who are just like them. Outside of that, a couple of other things. I reckon create some structure. So say, so here's what we're going to do. If we're going to help you, we need to make sure that we're doing these things, not in a chore kind of fashion, but rather because we want to be supportive. Uh, We're normalizing it. We're finding those role models that I've mentioned. And the last thing is, Let's just emphasize that there are all kinds of intelligences. One of the things that struck me most when I was way back doing my undergraduate uh, psychology degree was a guy called Howard Gardner who identified that intelligence isn't just a thing. It's not like you're either smart or you're not. Gardner found that there, it, he, he identified multiple intelligences and there's all sorts of theories around multiple intelligences these days. But Kylie, some kids have got spatial intelligence. Some have bodily or kinesthetic intelligence. Some kids have musical intelligence or linguistic intelligence or naturalistic intelligence or intrapersonal intelligence or interpersonal intelligence or logical and mathematical skills intelligence, and the list goes on. They were just the the eight that Gardner came up with. If you do a quick Google and try to find different forms of intelligences, you'll be amazed at what's there. I think we've got to just work so hard to not pigeonhole our kids and say, well, you've got additional needs, therefore you're going to struggle for the rest of your life. Not true not fair, far too limiting. And Mandy, I hope that we've been able to answer your question. 
helpfully. The Happy Families Podcast is produced by Justin Rulon from Bridge Media. Craig Bruce is our executive producer. And if you'd like more info about making your family happier, we would love for you to visit us at happyfamilies.com.au where you can find out about our brand new free course. Normally $74, but we're offering it to you for free right now. Just jump onto our Happy Families Facebook page, Dr. Justin Coulson's Happy Families. It's all about the timeout alternative. Seven days to move away from timeout as your modus operandi and find better ways to raise a happy family. Mm-hmm.